We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of The Big Red One on July 18th, 1980. It was written and directed by Samuel Fuller and released by United Artists. The Big Red One is largely based on writer-director Samuel Fuller's actual experiences in World War II, specifically the character of Zab, who, like Fuller, had only learned of the publishing of his first novel when he found a fellow soldier reading it on the front lines. Warner Brothers was interested in making The Big Red One in the 50s with John Wayne, not Fuller's first choice, as the sergeant, and sent director Fuller to Europe to scout for locations. Fuller said that he directed the film Merrill's Marauders in 1962 as a dry run for this film, when Jack L. Warner argued for extensive cuts to Merrill's Marauders, the plans for the Big Red One were dropped. Was that also a war movie? Yes. Peter Bogdanovich helped Fuller set the film back up at Paramount, but when the studio head Frank Yablans left, <laughs> the project was put in turnaround and eventually fell to Lorimar to produce and was eventually distributed by United Artists. Bogdanovich was originally set to produce the film and play the Robert Carradine part, but uh, he pulled out late in the game and brought in Gene Corman to produce. Apparently, Fuller was also pushing for Scorsese to play Private Vinci, but Scorsese had to back away from the project when the production schedule threatened to overlap with Raging Bulls. I didn't know he did acting roles. A couple small ones, but um, I guess he was going to be in here until it was too late. The bulk of the film was shot in Israel using Jewish extras to play all the Nazis, which made for a very disorienting set. Yeah. Evidently, when the actors playing the four horsemen first met Lee Marvin, he didn't speak to any of them for the whole drive to a shooting range where they'd be doing some training. And eventually, when he did speak, he said, which one of you is Carradine? And then Robert said, I am. And he said, fuck you, Carradine. <laughs> <laughs> and later he admitted that he'd only picked on Carradine because it was the only name that he recognized. <laughs> Evidently, the film was mistakenly placed on the UK's video nasty list and temporarily confiscated because the title was mistaken for a pornographic film. Was, so there was another film that had a similar name? No. Oh. <laughs> they just read <laughs> the big red one. They just saw the big nope, nope, And they were like, something. no, we don't have to read what this is about. Well, that's the way I was reading it before, too. Like, before I knew anything about it, I was like, the big red one. No, but it's the Yikes. big red one. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. which makes a difference. That sounds like it could be a subtitle to a Hellboy film. An extended version dubbed The Reconstruction includes an extra 47 minutes of extra footage. We did not watch that. What? We watched the theatrical cut. I think 47 I'm minutes. 47 <laughs> minutes. This movie is less than two hours. So 47 minutes is like 150% of the film, practically. Yeah. I don't think the film needs another 47 minutes. It no. is fine the way it is. It, there is an unwritten rule that a war movie has to be almost three hours long. It's so <laughs> silly. But I mean, that I think puts another checkbox in the why I don't like to watch war movies. Yeah, because they're all epics. Yeah. Although this one is like epic on a budget. Like you can tell well, where they're stretching. Which the is funny because I liked this one and I yeah. was like, I, maybe that's why. Maybe if everybody just took a hacksaw to a war movie, I might actually watch them. Yeah. They, they tried that. Uh, with Hacksaw Ridge. <laughs> <laughs> we start the film in black and white. In the ninth configuration, apparently. In the ninth configuration? What? Well, yeah, we open up with this big Christ on a cross vis visage overlooking yeah. in black with and white. mountains in black and white. <laughs> this reminded me of the moon scene. Yeah. The moonscape. By the way, if you're hearing a little clickety-clackety in the background, it's because we're, we're recording uh, in our garage and God is crying outside. So, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I could clean it up in the edit. But yeah, uh, Lee Marvin's walking through the aftermath of uh, Battlefield in France, and he stops to check a corpse for signs of life when a crazy horse races toward him, stomping on his rifle and just bashing it to pieces and uh, scaring him behind this huge crucifix. Suddenly, a Hun approaches, saying the war is over in German with his hands up, but Lee Marvin knives him in the chest, and we tilt up to Jesus on the cross with ants in his eyes. 
we head back to the trenches. Lee Marvin tells a fellow soldier what happened. Uh, he collected a strip of red fabric, and he was inspired by the, the dead Hun's helmet to stitch a one onto his shoulder to represent the 1st Infantry Division. The guy asks Marvin when he killed this Hun, and he says that the armistice was signed at 11 a.m., and hands him a bottle to drink and says the war's been over for four hours. And he says, didn't know it was over. And he says, he did. Narration from Robert Carradine as Zab starts up. I could have lived without any of this, actually. I didn't know which character. I mean, until because you are telling me now, I guess, yeah, that might have been him. But throughout the entire film, I had no idea who was talking. As soon as it started, I, I recognized it as Louis Skullnick from Revenge of the Nerds. I yeah. was like, this is definitely Robert Carradine. I didn't even know he was in the movie. And I was like, I know the actor whose voice this is. Well, yeah, this but is... they never make an establishment of which they character really. it is throughout the whole film. Yeah, yeah. He, he never refers to himself as I. Like, Well, I, he kind of does. When he's going around and introducing each of these guys, he says, and that's me, Zap. And then he talks about you oh, know, his backstory. I guess I missed that. N- knowing that there's a 47-minute longer version, I have a feeling that this narration probably wasn't in it. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't, but it also feels like the movie has a bit of an identity crisis as far as who the main character is. Because Lee Marvin's character starts the film by himself, mm-hmm. and you know he he rides through it. With all sorts of stuff happening to him. But he doesn't really have an arc. Like, he doesn't seem to change much. Uh, Not as much as the Mark Hamill character seems to change. Yes. Yeah. And usually the person who changes the most is the main character. Zab doesn't change at all, I don't feel like. And Zab is not interesting enough to be the main character of this movie. So, it's just, I, I don't know who I'm supposed to focus on. I feel like Zab is definitely based on Fuller. So, it would make sense for him to Yeah, but I never be, would have picked him out of the crowd to be the lead character of this. He, he didn't play an important role in any of the events. Yeah, not really. I guess I would come around with that only in that he's the writer. That he wrote this so story. So he's the that storyteller. Like, yeah. So yeah. he's the main character. But it but just because you're the narrator doesn't mean it's your story. Yeah, no, that's true. But, but I have a feeling that this is more like that this is the story that he's writing. Yeah. And we're just hearing him write it. Because basically everything that happened in this movie happened to Samuel Fuller during the war. So it's like... He edited his diary into the 10 most interesting things that happened to him during World War II mm-hmm. and then made a movie about it. But yeah, Robert Carradine is here and he's explaining the. He just told us the origin of the Big Red One. That basically, he's he's taking credit for that flashback we just saw, that, that he told us that information. And we fast forward to North Africa in 1942. We're in color this time and we're introduced to uh, Marvin's, uh, referred to as the Sergeant's Wet Noses. I don't think they ever give him a name. They just call him Sergeant for the rest of the movie. Yeah. So the four characters are Griff, the sharpshooter, played by Mark Hamill, Johnson, a pig farmer with hemorrhoids who barely does anything in this movie. There's a few characters that are, I think, considered extras that are that play a bigger part than this guy does to me. Vincy, a street kid who played Hot Noise on the Sax, and Zab, a novelist looking for a war novel inspiration. So he basically enlisted specifically so he could write stories about war. Zab mentions a book that he wrote called The Dark Deadline, which is likely a reference to director Fuller's own novel, The Dark Page. He explains that it's an unpublished mystery novel and that he left it with his mother before he left for the war. Griff is drawing a large and not particularly good political cartoon, but uh, that never really pays off that he's a cartoonist either. The cartoon is anti-Vichy French, and he has to explain to Johnson that no, Vichy is not a kind of soda, but rather the French fighting on the Nazi side. As a precaution, they have dropped leaflets into North Africa, where the French soldiers are, and they will wear American flags hoping to avoid a confrontation altogether. They all start putting condoms on their rifles to keep them dry in the water. I don't see how that could help at all. No, because there's still all kinds of other parts of the gun. Right, but I don't doubt that this is based on something that they actually did. I just wonder how actually useful it was that they were doing it. At the start of the scene, I did not realize he was talking about the guns. I think that was intentional. Oh, like you, you're just like, all right, everybody, put, put on your condoms. You don't want salt, salt water, water getting in there. Like, Is that a thing? Do you want to keep salt water out of yeah, your penis? Definitely <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, man. <laughs> um, Burns for days. <laughs> they all start putting condoms on their rifles, and Frenchmen on the beach are reading the leaflets that uh, Marvin mentioned in the dark when they hear an announcement coming from the water. The Americans announce their approach, which I feel like they also shouldn't have done. Like, the leaflets should have been enough. Yeah. I don't know why you're like, shoot this way on the way into the well, beach. Well, I, I guess it's just, 
I don't know what the rules of engagement are in this situation. I also wonder if it wasn't just a budgetary thing where they were like, we don't have a lot of boats, so for the for the, when they are beaching, we'll have inserts, but for the wide shots, we'll just have yeah. the sound play. Well, I think it's also to sort of be like, hey, in good faith, those leaflets weren't lying. We are the Americans. We're coming. Yeah. We're not going to shoot you. And, you know, because if you were trying to pull one over on them, mm-hmm. I don't think you would have announced yourself once you got there. Yeah. But also, who would have been trying to sneak in? Yeah, if posing it as the Americans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like I, the like, Germans are like, "We already took over, and you're <laughs> fighting for us now. Please don't shoot at us. We're pretending to be Americans." <laughs> <clears throat> the commanding officer on the beach says, "Hold your fire," but then a general shows up and demands action. He shoots a soldier who disobeys a direct order and starts firing one of the big guns himself, kicking off a short skirmish. The Vichy general is very quickly killed by his own men who wanted to join the Americans, but now that they're shooting back and forth, it's kind of too late to announce that. But So they were Vichy. Well, technically speaking, they were they were under a general. That a was, Vichy general, yeah. yeah. But, but they were like... The they most... didn't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the Americans gave them the opportunity to be like, yeah, we don't want to do that. Right. And if that general hadn't gotten to that gun, then basically they, they could have just Walked killed that general and avoided this whole fight. Because that was the only guy who was like trying to mm-hmm. prove his loyalty to the the Germans. Some of the Frenchmen who refused their general's orders are ironically being killed in this shootout by the Americans. Griff fires one shot way off target and then totally freezes up for the rest of the fight. Eventually, Captain Chapier on the French side gets a hold of a speakerphone and announces their surrender and the general's death. But instead of accepting a surrender, basically in response the Americans say... Well, you, you can't surrender unless you're surrendering. It, basically, your choices are to continue fighting with us or fight with the Germans. Yeah. But neither one is a surrender. You're just joining a different army. Yeah. They they, they won't accept a surrender. So if you if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna claim to still be Vichy after this fight is over. Yeah. Then you might as well just keep fighting. Yeah. After that, everyone basically greets each other joyfully on the beach, even as their friends are dying in puddles around them. Griff was pretty messed up about having frozen like that we see a bit with the troops sitting around eating lunch near a beach and a small girl is following the sergeant around wherever he goes when griff finally shows up he tells the sergeant that he can't murder anybody and sarge explains the difference between murder and killing because we don't murder we kill it's the same thing the hell it is griff you don't murder animals you kill them this setting kind of reminded me of Lawrence of Arabia. Sure. This, yeah. The, just the general look about. I could see that. Wait, but they both happen in North Africa, right? Um, I mean, do you consider Arabia part of Africa? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I don't I, know I, if I it's Europe. I don't want. I don't, <laughs> I don't want, know if it's Asia. I don't want to offend uh, any listeners who might be from the Middle East who who do not consider themselves part of Africa or Europe. Who knows? They're their own continent. Sarge eventually gives the lunch that he's eating to this young girl that's following him around, because clearly that's what she's been waiting for. We cut to the German side on some African sand dunes, and General Schroeder speaks with some of his men about the Big Red One. One of them, Gerd, tells a very unpatriotic story about the hymn of Hitler's party that they're all listening to. Apparently, it was originally a poem by Horst Wessel. Horst Wessel was a pimp who supplied Hitler with baby faces like you. He was killed in a brawl over a whore in Berlin. <laughs> a poem by a pimp became the hymn of Hitler's party. That right, Schroeder? Schroeder's not amused by this little anecdote, and Gerd complains that Schroeder used to be tough. He says, in Libya, I saw him murder a German officer, and he says, I didn't murder him, Gerd, I killed him. He ran from a fight with the British. And then Schroeder announces their next move through the Kazarine Pass behind a panzer division, and Gerd says, no, nah, I'm not going to choke on tank fumes. I'm no damned Nazi fanatic like you. Germany is through singing for Hitler. And then, of course, as to, as to be expected, he's shot dead and tumbles down this sand dune. You're getting like a, a comparison of the two two conversations of the same type, right? In that the sergeant talking with Griff about you got to you know you don't murder or you kill him, but I guess in a in a way 
accepting his dis- dissent, like trying to trying to talk him into it, but not like trying to blame him or kill him for it. But I also feel like what what Gerd is saying is different than what Griffin is saying. Yeah, no, but I mean, it's like it's also just how how the different sides are handling the situation. Yeah, but I feel like if Griffin had said, "Fuck America," I'm not going to kill any more people. Like I'm not going to dance to the president's drum anymore. That the Sarge would have killed him. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I thought. I thought the point I, I, of this I, was I, more that they're similar than that they, they are different. I think he said it to hell with FDR. I don't know if he would have just outright killed him. I think if he refused a direct order, he would have. He tries to later. I mean, he's not <laughs> trying to, but I think he would have done it later. Um, I also am not a big fan of seeing, and I think this is the last time that we do this where we see the other side and having conversations that are outside of the knowledge of the writer. Or the yeah, narrator. that is weird. I'm fine with having a narrator in most films, but the narrator can't know things that, that no one ever told him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, conceivably he learned this after the movie, but then it's a spoiler that he survives the film. Yeah. And also how would he have had this conversation with these Germans about this German who got shot for some reason? Well, because he encounters Schroeder later in the film. Oh, does he? Yeah. Oh, Oh, that's a, that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was confused at who that was. Yep, that's who it was. The Allied front is headed to Spiva, but the big red one is stationed around back at the Kazarine Pass because they're like, oh, there's an off chance that they're going to bring the tanks through here. And, of course, that's where they bring all the tanks through. Um, It's kind of funny to have Mark Hamill in Israel pretending to be in Tunisia when the first three Star Wars movies were all shot in Tunisia pretending to be a galaxy far, far away. The men studiously brush dust from their rifles in the path of a tank division and they're left with no option but to dig in and literally bury themselves in the path of these tanks yeah what was the plan here i don't know and i can't believe that they dug these holes this deep and 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 that quickly and that 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 deep that quickly and that none of the german soldiers on foot noticed that saw these gigantic holes (laughs) but uh they were only person-sized holes and i presume that they were squatting in them so they probably weren't six foot deep holes but still Mm. But even if they're three and a half or I four foot deep. what was happening was, so there was a large rock and the path sort of split around both sides of this rock. And mm-hmm. I think what they were anticipating was, let's go left, let's hope they go right and they won't run over us and we'll mm-hmm. just hide in these holes. But that's not what happens. Zab stupidly leaves a freshly stomped cigar on the ground, but that doesn't really matter. It's yeah, just to really scare us. Of, well, I was really worried about that and then it never came back. Yeah. But uh, they get into these holes, and uh, somehow these Germans didn't notice the holes or the cigar. And as the tanks are moving over the holes, the men are screaming one at a time. Yeah. But it's not. It's clear that the tank isn't even touching some of them. I, so I they're guess, just screaming out of fear? I, I guess the tunnel... I, I, I'm assuming that, that the hole's collapsing around them. Maybe. But I don't, I'm not an expert on tanks, but... The whole concept of the tank is that the weight, weight is displaced. It's, yeah, it's distributed. Um, and so I don't, unless that dirt is extremely loose, which would make sense that they were able to dig these holes this quick. Yeah. But, and just the pressure of it was enough to so, collapse it. So I wasn't but, clear. Did they die? Did the, Yeah. Were they I hurt? think they are all dying because we specifically see all four of our main characters jump out of their holes. Okay. And so the presumption is the other guys didn't jump and out. And the one who didn't do that dead. got killed. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, at the last second, we see our four guys jump out, and a small firefight ensues. The sergeant is shot in the back and falls to his knees, reenacting what actually happened to Lee Marvin in World War II, though he fought in the Pacific Theater, not in Africa. And the tanks start firing on the Americans as they're scattering over these rocky hillsides on either side of the pass. Sarge wakes up, who knows how much later, months, weeks? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, But he wakes up in a temporary German hospital in Tunis, where he's being informed the war is over for you we won you lost suddenly air raid sirens are blaring and sarge tries to escape this unmarked hospital because that's what gets bombed is the unmarked hospitals yeah and an injured man from the big red one enters and he's in search of some compatriots when he finds sarge he informs him that the big red one swept through the kazarine pass after them and basically took a lot of targets including tunis and sarge assumes that this man is mistaken because he reminds him this is tunis before a squad of americans sweep through the hospital with rifles and sarge is like oh 
You did take Tunis. Okay, that's cool. So what was the point of the guy lying to him? That was someone that was fa- like running the place, running the facility on the German side. Yeah. It right. was it was what- right before the, the Americans had taken the hospital. Oh, okay. So that guy didn't know that Tunis had been taken. Exactly. And and he was, oh, the he only was just hint trying they had to, was the air raid siren. He was just trying to prevent this guy from trying to killing escape, people? Or, yeah, I mean, the, the, it's like the Tokyo Rose kind of situation of like- Yeah, you just say, oh, you're losing. Everything's you, you, going our way. They just have our way. Dis- discouraging information. Yeah. Hmm. It's like in, in Saving Private Ryan when they're- in the being shot at and they're hungered down the Germans on the PA and it says the Statue of Liberty is kaput. kaput. That's disconcerting. <laughs> we cut to Sarge arriving in Algiers, not wanting to be left out of an upcoming mission uh, through Sicily with his men. Somehow out of the original 12 man rifle squad it is now down to the four men we've been following. They rise slowly on the beach and run to reunite with their sergeant. And we are suddenly in Sicily, 1943. <laughs> it's like this grand sweeping music. And it's like, oh, this yeah. is the end of the movie. But then, <laughs> he made it back to his mind. We also go to this super wide shot because they're like, what would happen here? It's like, they're not going to run up and hug him. Yeah. Because that's not what this sergeant would put up with. So exactly. they're just going to run up and get close and be like, hi, Sarge. And then go back to the water. So they just go super wide so that your brain can just fill in the blanks of what happened when they reunited. Yeah. Um, I also like that Lee Marvin is smoking a cigar through his robes. Yes. But also at this point, why is he still wearing the robes? Why not? Why is he trying to conceal his face from other soldiers? Because it, it's a secret face. Sicily, 1943. <laughs> on the boat there, another soldier named Shep starts ragging on Vinci about being Italian. And uh, he doesn't count on him to fight against other Italians in Sicily. And he says, I think all you'll do is drink Dago Red and sing O Solo Mio. And then Zab grabs the guy and holds his mouth open so Vinci can jam his rifle in. And then he just starts singing O Solo Mio. Um, but he, I think those are the only words he knew because after that he just goes la 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 la. <laughs> but the guy, the guy's mouth he's holding the gun in is like actually bleeding from yeah it. i'm not surprised and he's just dripping with sweat yeah there's a lot of really sweaty things going on in this movie <laughs> yeah and he's like i like how sold mio shep apparently found a roll of toilet paper at the hotel in algiers and he plans to bring it with him but as they're approaching the beach in our our second beach assault in this film it gets shot out of his hands we all know what a precious commodity toilet paper is yes. now we yes. appreciate this we scene didn't, we didn't appreciate it back then but now we do they attack a second beach and move inland Vinci asks for a transfer, and Sarge transfers him to the point because he's not going to get put in a different group. As they approach an abandoned village, they send Vinci as a point man in case they're snipers. And apparently that was the the best uh, plan that West Point could come up with was, here's how you find a sniper. Push a guy out there, and if he explodes, then, uh, then there's bad guys. I mean, I feel like this whole movie was sort of like that for me because I don't watch more war movies. I don't know a lot about this stuff but i'm like it is horrifying to see how we actually dealt with this stuff and i'm sure we have progressed a lot since world war ii in terms of our tactics but like literally just using people in this way is just so horrifying i also feel like if you send one guy out you can't all follow him that quickly because if the sniper's not going to give away his position, then he has no motivation to kill the first guy mm-hmm. when six more guys are going to come out otherwise. Yeah. So why don't you just wait and see if there's other people with him? Because this guy's probably not by himself here. At a split, Vinci takes the right, and he sends Sarge and the boys around to the left. Sarge approaches a corner, and he finds an enemy grenadier. He tosses the man one of his own grenades, and the man drops the one he was holding to catch Sarge's, which I guess in essence set both of them off. It's like one of those things... Where I feel like you hand somebody something when they're on the phone, they'll just take it. Yeah. Like if you throw a grenade at somebody, they'll drop their own grenade. Yeah, but <laughs> the funny thing is it didn't even have to be a grenade. He could have thrown him like a hot dog and the guy would have dropped his own grenade. <laughs> uh, that would have been a very different scene. <laughs> yeah. This is all I have. It's it like, what is it in uh, Escape from New York or Escape from L.A.? It's like no one draws till this can hits the ground. Yeah. Well, it's also like uh, in uh, Where the Buffalo Roam earlier this year when they're about to go into court and... Uh, Hunter just hands his sandwich to the the prosecuting attorney as he's like turning around to go into the courtroom and the guy takes it like without thinking about it and he's like fuck am I going to do with this sandwich now <laughs> when the smoke clears Sarge sees that Finchie had the guy in his sights the whole time and that 
it was basically revenge for being made the point man and it's like okay well your reward is you get to stay the point man then zab's narration gets into the war movie trope of avoiding getting to know your fellow soldiers because they come and go so fast a baby-faced soldier named smitty brings them a bucket of water and uh, the four of them all use it before the bucket makes it back around the loop to him when he leaves he he trips over um there's a, a trip line to a mine and he lands on it and it blows off one of his balls Lee Marvin just kind of picks it up and chucks it. Yeah. Sarge gets to him first and he's like, oh, that's just, that's not to kill you. It's to castrate you. And it's like, why do they make traps just to castrate people? Just kill me. (laughs) But he's like, just one of your balls, Smitty. And he picks it up and it's just like a hunk of meat. A big hunk of bloody meat and he throws it across the court. He's like, you can live without it. That's why they gave you two. So you could trip over two of these lines. (laughs) After two, you're done. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Moving through fields between cities, they take shelter in a natural cave formation. They talk about just how surrounded they are and that all of their big guns and tanks are still on the water. They haven't even made it to Europe yet. Griff considers running away, but rethinks it, knowing that Sarge will shoot him, and I'm pretty sure that he would have here if he tried to just run out. They hear another Panzer Division moving past. Uh, Probably the same tanks, but it's a different Panzer Division. An enemy soldier moves into the mouth of the cave to take a piss. And then uh, eventually he just leaves. A second soldier moves deeper into the cave to do a search, and they discreetly stab him to death as bombs are suddenly heard going off outside the cave. Griff recognizes the explosions as American weaponry somehow, and he says, I thought our guns were still on the water. Now enemy soldiers looking for safety from the bombs are rushing into the cave one at a time, luckily, and Sarge has the men set up a relay to shoot these guys as they're coming in and then move the bodies so that people continue to come in. Eventually, the shooting stops and the bombs stop and Sarge radios his lieutenant. And we learn that the artillery fire came from the Navy, a ship that's like miles offshore and somehow took out this entire Panzer Division. And there's literally zero survivors, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, because I guess the the survivors were running into the cave and they got <laughs> blasted. Yeah, but were, were there only seven people with these tanks? Because uh, there should be more survivors than this. Yeah, and I mean, generally... Yes, these Navy ships can shoot miles, but you need someone spotting the targets. Right. You can't do it blind, and you can't hit 15 people in the desert. Well, the others might have run inland or something, but either way, they've been scared off from this location. Yeah. Now they're in Sicily, and they're looking for a big gun called an SP that the Allies have. SP, of course, Scientology-wise, is a suppressive person. We all know that. Because we haven't mentioned it on the show yet, but we're all Scientologists. So don't be a suppressive person. That's not true. (laughs) None of that is true. But I am glad that they used several tactics in this movie. To fill you in. To fill me in on what the hell is going on with all these war terms. Because I don't know what any of them mean. (laughs) Um, But then it didn't end up being that. It ended up being just a tank and a house. Well, it had wheels, but it was just rolled into a house. Yeah. Um, was it a, was it just a tank? I think it was just a tank hiding inside of a house. Oh, a so they, maybe they misinterpreted what kind of weapon it was. Yeah. But either way, th- they were hoping that spy planes would find it, but for whatever reason, they haven't yet. So Vinci, moving through Sicily, falls down a stone staircase and just by happenstance lands on a box full of 2500 bucks worth of lira. Can It's for my old man. He always wanted to open up his own bagel shop. Which, and this line reading... I, 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 yeah, he like stumbles over it. Yeah, I, I went back over and over and over again to re-listen. It's like, he always wanted to open his own bagel shop. Yeah. And it's like, was that the best take you got yeah. of, this, of him saying this line? Like, what, 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 what was I supposed to say? Bagel shop, sorry. Yeah, that's great. Cut print. And then they meet Italian Finn Wolfhard in the village. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's exactly what he said. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's, moving through, uh, he's moving through this broken down town. He's uh he's leading a donkey with a, a trailer carrying the the sun bloated corpse of his mother. He also already has a group of soldiers as an escort. He explains to them that his mom died and he wants to bury her with his father and they ask if the kid knows where the SP is for some reason, but he happens to and but the, here's where they use they the explain, trick that you said yeah, cuz he's like, yeah, kid. he says he doesn't know what an SP is and he's like, "Hey, knucklehead, ask him where the thing is tell him it's a it's a big gun on wheels it's a se- self-propelled i guess is sp yeah. right self-propelled gun and the kid knows exactly what he's talking about 
which shocks all of them to the point that I don't know why they asked to this kid where this gun was. But they agree to bring his mother if he shows them. They're like, oh, we'll just park her in the shade here and we'll come back and get a tow later. And he's like, no, we're going to bring her the whole way and you're going to do what you said or I'm not going to show you the gun at all. And he wants an ambulance. He wants her body to get taken to the cemetery in Jela, and he wants a coffin with four handles. So he leads them true to his word and they find the gun it's uh it's housed in this hollowed out building firing out of a window so it's invisible from above because it just looks like a house and to complete the picture they've surrounded it with uh, women forced to pretend to toil in the fields under a supervisor lee marvin says it makes for an, a nice peaceful picture from the air they leave a man behind to take out the schmeiser which is what they call the the guy supervising the women in the field but it's not griff who's the sharpshooter i guess he's just well, he's still not a terrible shooter now, and he doesn't want to kill anybody. So his instructions are when he hears them shooting to kill this guy on the field. They sneak up behind the building, and they find three or four men working the gun. One's on the radio, one's reading paper, one is shaving, and Sarge assigns each man a target by pantomiming their activities. And the next time the, the SP goes off, they fire on all these guys and kill them all simultaneously and then the schmeiser in the field is taken out and the women with scythes all start slicing up the dead schmeiser in the field which is a great, great you have scene. like his pov looking up at the sky and then all these women come in and just start swinging their scythes down on him uh and ju- just for clarity after a little bit of googling it looks like sp can be a term used for a tank oh okay. it, it, well, spg yeah. is a type of it can be a type well, of tank. okay cool because I guess the tank is self-propelled. There, there's yes. various <laughs> versions of it. There's kinds. There's kinds of guns that are on like trucks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But there's you know a, a, a tank could be considered an, an SPG or a self-propelled gun or artillery. Yeah. All right. To show their appreciation, these women cook the Americans a huge meal for freeing them and and liberating their their village. The boy sits off on his own, eating by himself, just kind of sad until Sarge gets confirmation that. A silk-lined coffin with six handles is inbound, and I wanted the kid to be like, I said four handles! <laughs> he only wanted four, and no more! Not one handle more! <laughs> and they just break him off. Disrespect. Griff draws pictures for the women and thanks for the meal, but we don't see the pictures, and that's the last time he draws anything in this movie. Before they leave Sicily, Sarge is looking for his helmet, and a girl appears and returns it to him, decorated in flowers. Zab says, the Krauts are going to spot that garden from a mile away. And he's looking at the girl and he says, I like the smell. I really wanted him to wear this helmet like this for the rest of the movie, but <laughs> he does not. But he does wear it out of the village like that. Suddenly we're back in the boats again prepping for D-Day. A guy named Lemchek has been assigned number two for the mission. And he's trying desperately to swap with somebody else. They Anybody did have else. a break here though. What's that? Yeah, they had, they had like a nine month break or something right, like yes. that. So they, they got some leave and then they're back. But we don't see any of it. No, no. <laughs> he says he's willing to pay $10,000 in the form of his like GI insurance, basically. If I get killed, I get $10,000. I'll put you down as my dependent and you'll get the money. But nobody wants his number two, which makes sense. They hit Omaha Beach the next morning. I'm betting that all these boat scenes were shot the same day and probably all three beach storming scenes were shot on the same beach. Part of what makes this movie feel a little cheap is that we keep repeating scenes and locations. Mm-hmm. Lemchek is shot first, and Vinci laments having passed up on ten thousand dollars. But that doesn't make any sense to me because if he if he was had, number two, he probably would right, have died later in the scene. If he had taken up on it, he would have been the one that was dead. Yeah. Well, he didn't die because he was number two here. He he died before they even started counting off numbers to put the the Bangalore's. Bangalore together. But yeah, so... So wait, the number was for what? Getting what off What order you're going to put that TNT pipe together? Yeah, so I'm just saying if he, if he hadn't... But he got he got killed before they even made it fully onto the beach. Oh, okay, I yeah. guess. I mean, his odds of survival were still very low. Yes. Yeah. But given how lucky these four guys are... He they could have probably... saved a lot of men by just putting Vinci number one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Put the lucky guy first. <laughs> the camera's on you a lot. Maybe you should go first. <laughs> we see a wristwatch of a dead soldier in the tide. I don't know if this is supposed to be Lemchek. But uh, right now the time says 6.30. We're assuming that's when they hit the beach. Uh, The men are basically pinned under heavy fire and can't move in either direction because there's a big wall of barbed wire that was supposed to be taken out by four different teams before them. And uh, it didn't get bombed. It didn't get bazookaed. And so now it basically falls to them to take care of. So they have a thing called a Bangalore relay. 
which is just a really dumb looking invention Um, (laughs) it's a big metal tube full of tnt and they have to like bring it over in segments and then connect it where they want it to go off yep and each of them carries like one piece out so that they can assemble it all together because i guess it's too heavy for one person to carry by himself right uh number one is sent out with two segments of the bangalore right as he is basically crossing over into the no man's land he gets blown up but somehow his segments of bangalore don't explode Mm -hmm. which i guess is good number two lemchek is no more so number three is sent out and he connects his bangalore segments to number ones and then gets killed number four is sent out he makes a little more progress he drags the pieces further up the beach and then he's shot five heads out five and six are shot seven's already dead so eight is up and that's griff Uh, zab tells him he better survive because zab is nine and doesn't want to go out here griff falls once next to the body of one of the men sent earlier and i can't tell exactly what he's looking at here at first i thought the implication was that this guy is pretending to be dead so that the enemy would stop shooting at him and he Mm -hmm. doesn't care if they're sending people after him his eyes are open they are but people die that way but then when i rewatched it i i think the implication is supposed to be that he's just freaked out by seeing a dead person up close Mm -hmm. Mm. but i'm not 100 percent sure on that i feel like if you were faking it that when you got up after they successfully set off the bangalore Mm -hmm. someone would shoot you from your own team for faking it yeah well that's what the sarge did not yeah yeah was it the sarge at the beginning when when griff that's exactly what's happening here is that while he's looking at this guy he's trying to decide if he's going to move again because he's like paralyzed by this fear and then griff starts shooting in a big circle around him and i'm pretty confident at this point that if he hadn't if he hadn't worked it out that sarge would have actually hit him maybe Mm -hmm. in like you know an arm first to be like (laughs) hey these are real bullets you know i don't have blanks for intimidating you but griff eventually gets the whole tnt tube well not the whole thing he drops about half of it behind him as he's moving but for some reason you don't need all of it i don't understand this weapon i don't get how it works i don't either it's a tube full of tnt and somehow this is gonna blow a hole in the barbed wire correct and it does. But, like, how does a really long tube of TNT make a difference? Just throw a whole goddamn, like, you Just know, throw a stick. Or just throw a bunch of sticks of dynamite in there. Like, yeah. why throw a bunch of grenades in there? Just why does it have to be a here. tube of dynamite? Yeah, it's weird. I'm assuming that they did the research as far as how this no, is. No, I think that it's a real thing. But even no, Zab no, there says, no, it's a real, like, to meet the guy who came up with this piece of shit. It, it's a real thing because they use him in Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. But, uh... I don't know exactly why. What the benefit would be? Yeah, like why he couldn't like like you guys are saying, just like bundle of TNT with a wire. Uh, maybe the tube protects. I'm wondering if the tube is just the to keep it from blowing up from enemy fire. Correct, and 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 the tube is actually concealing the 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 wiring that you need. Like so you so you, every time you assemble a tube, you're connecting a piece of the wiring. Right. Or maybe and, you're just detonating at like a longer distance because you need it to get further away from you. Right, like if right. this if this, let's say, you know, wall of barbed wire is, you know, ten feet wide, you need you need to cover that whole wall with a hole. But the purpose yeah, the, I mean the purpose is to just completely obliterate whatever is around there so they would have a place for their tanks and other vehicles to to come up on shore yeah so this whole scene is is done in private ryan right like yeah. the opening of private ryan is this whole battle scene and it's definitely better in that movie not just because of the budget but i feel like there's too many moments here where the camera is locked down where you don't it doesn't feel like a real situation it feels like a reenactment because that's what it is but in saving private ryan like every shot is handheld every shot is pov every shot there's 30 people in it screaming at each other because they don't know what's going on people are just getting shot constantly and it just feels i mean i don't know that it was more realistic but i mean from what i understand from the reviews of people who were there who saw that scene that it was like exactly how it went down it captures the chaos of being there yeah but uh just as he's getting the the bangalore underneath the barbed wire we get a taste of the soundtrack that felt like uh willy wonka's pure imagination to me then they blow the hole and the wire opens up and they radio in that they have 
they have their exit on the beach. They have a way to get through now. We see the wristwatch again, and now the blood red tide uh, is washing over the hand, and we see that it's 9.15, which is nearly three hours after they hit the beach. It seems like that would be equally dangerous, though, to be like, hey, we only have one way to funnel through this beach so let's right. shove everybody through this one place where they can still just with all this artillery just focus on this one hole we just made yeah i also feel like if it was so dangerous to sneak up there with one piece of the bangalore mine then why is it safe for all of us to just get out right now and walk up to this hole in the gate it's not it's like there's still people shooting at all of us we just basically cut to a break in the next city where zab is playing some basketball when he notices a soldier named Kaiser reading The Dark Deadline, he moves in creepily close before asking what the man thinks of his book, and Kaiser says it's damn good. And Zab says, you know, my mother sent that to me for my birthday. And he tells Kaiser that he wrote it, and then Kaiser jokes in response that he printed it. Here we get a really weird scene. A bunch of Germans in the same field where Sarge murdered the Hun after World War I are arranging themselves to appear dead, draped over a tank as a trap. This feels like something you would do if there were a platoon coming that vastly outnumbered you yeah. and you needed like a last minute plan. But there's way more of these guys mm-hmm. than there are in the team coming th- to get them. I don't think there were though. I think that there were only a handful of German sh- soldiers there. But they and also a had large, a tank. <laughs> but a large portion of them were already dead. You're saying there were real dead people. There was a lot of real dead people there, and there was only a handful of guys that were left, and so I think their strategy was to to, to play dead to get the drop on them. Yeah. I I know that at least the guy they draped over the top of the tank was dead. I think a bunch more in the field were also dead. Because that's the whole way that they discovered is the different uniforms. Right. Uh, there was there was enough of them, and they had a tank that was clearly functional yeah. because like they the, use the it. the gun works on the side of it. Yeah. If you'd have just let the Americans get closer and then start firing on them, mm-hmm. you win. I don't know what their plan was here. Maybe they didn't know how many people were coming. I guess. But also, as far as the story of this movie is, what was the purpose of having it occur back at this location? Yeah, there was no significance Be- to it. Because the significant scene that happens happens at the end of the movie completely somewhere else. Yeah. Um, it seems like this this should have been the scene that was in the end of the movie. Yeah, this would be the first one-hour-long war movie. <laughs> the men find a monument to the lives lost in World War I, and they mistake it for this war because they recognize so many names. But when they say the names are the same, Sarge says, They always are. Kaiser is sent ahead to inspect the scene and all the dead Germans in this trap. One German is watching from high up on the crucifix and radioing to the men on the ground. And Kaiser observes the Germans playing possum and totally buys it. But it's not really his fault because, you know, he calls the rest of the men over and they all buy it too. That's why they had like bayonets is you just start stabbing bodies Mm -hmm. as you're going through the field. Yeah. Uh, There's a a really great scene in uh, Fury where they're in the tank and uh, the one guy won't fire the gun. He's like, those guys are already dead. It's like, uh, he goes, what are you, a doctor? Keep firing. Yeah. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. The Germans wait way too long to take any kind of action. In the tank, Sarge notices that they have different callers, so they're probably not from the same group. There were infantry mixed in with the people running the tank. He covers their mouths to stab them one at a time. And so we get this little hint that each of them is alive as they're like holding their breath or trying to struggle at the last second, but not enough to signal to the other guys in the tank with them that they've just been killed. He radios to announce their situation to the lieutenant, and uh, he's using some some code. He says that he's Sergeant Possum, which I guess is, I don't know if that's specific code for I'm in the middle of a bunch of people pretending to be dead because mm-hmm. Possum would make sense. Is this is that is that a standard thing that happens? I don't happens? know if that's a standard thing, but I think it but, was. But he says, oh, you're in an ambush? So it's something like that. Yeah. Like the guy knew exactly what he meant. Uh, but he says, Hey, so you're kind of on your own, though, because we're really busy. So (laughs) your call is important to us. Please stay on the line. (laughs) Higher than normal call volume. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We are currently experiencing. As they're leaving, Kaiser notices a live soldier moving on the ground. And I can't tell who shoots first. If Kaiser shoots at them or if the Germans try to take advantage of them No, Kaiser shoots first. Okay, because he does turn around and aim his gun, but I think the... 
I couldn't tell if the guy on the ground actually shot at him first or not. Oh, I don't think so. I think it's Kaiser's fault for sure that cuz they they seemed like they were getting away with it because yeah. they used the excuse. They very loudly say Hey, we we have to bring them over the hill. We had to bring the rest of the troops over here, yeah. so we had to lead them over here because they don't know where we are. Mm-hmm. And so they were sort of baiting yeah. them to say, "Hey, we're going like, to bring you more targets. You know to what? Stay where you are. Let's go dig up all of that beer and bury it here. This looks much softer. <laughs> Probably <laughs> a better place for it. Good thing we got all that Nazi gold we stole. Yeah, we'll hide it here in the <laughs> with this cross. We'll tell the president he can come over the hill in just a moment." <laughs> so they all start shooting back and forth someone jumps into the tank and makes fast work of the leftover germans because like you said this is a functional tank with a lot of ammunition in it and uh he just takes out everybody else on the field while the americans are basically hiding behind the tank only kaiser is hit in this scene of course and they patch him up real quick they don't take out the guy behind the cross though no they don't they leave him up there for the whole scene it's very weird. And they, it doesn't come back. Though. No. He never he never shows them discovering him or yeah. him dying or anything. Maybe he, it's in the 47 minutes of other footage. Yeah. I think uh, he was just embarrassed about what happened. He's like, well, I forgot to tell them to kill the Americans. This is kind of my fault. <laughs> when I said play dead, you're all method. Well, he yeah. did, he did like, you know, reprimand them. He's like, if you move, I'll shoot you. Yeah. So he, he made them wait through this whole thing. Maybe his plan was always like, these guys seem pretty cool. I'm going to let them kill my friends. <laughs> um, then I'll be friends with them. This thing is covered in ants. <laughs> oh, my God, ants. <laughs> a man on a motorcycle with a sidecar comes racing up to them and just flips over the handlebar when he stops. It seems like he's dying, but nobody cares. A woman is about to give birth in his sidecar, and he came to them for help. They bring her into the tank. Which... <laughs> I, what? I guess it's safer in there than in the field because there were germans but germ germans, germans. yeah <laughs> you gotta stay away from the germs i think it's just protecting them in a potentially you know dangerous war zone yeah can I, can I get into this tank with all these corpses we stand no yeah. he said move the bodies and then put her in there yeah there's more <laughs> bodies outside the tank to be fair there's billions if you count all of them yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Every person who has ever lived or died is outside of this yeah. tank. <laughs> um, they bring her into the tank and they tie her legs up in the air with the bands of bullets that are strung from the ceiling. I did like the moment though where he's like, turn the bullets around. Like she feels threatened by the fact that the bullets are pointed at her. If I didn't speak English though and a bunch of soldiers brought me into a tank and strung me up and pulled out a fat stack of condoms, I would be very worried. <laughs> um, but they're using them as an approximation of rubber gloves that would not work That doesn't at all. help at yeah. all. It's like, this is perfect because they're covered in sperm Now you just have like these Vulcan hands <laughs> yeah. that are like, yeah. trying to deliver you, babies with just your fingertips. You, get, you look like one of those crab people from the circus. <laughs> or Danny DeVito in freaking Batman Returns. <laughs> there you go. Johnson is assisting the birth because he should do something in this movie. <laughs> but uh, he's just like pushing on her belly like... That's how you get it out, right? That's, yeah, that's like it's a Play-Doh extruder and the baby's just going to come out <laughs> weird star shape. It's like the pop bubble in trouble. You just yeah. like, give it a little pop and that baby yeah. shoots right out. He asks Sarge how to say push in French and he says pousse. And he says pussy, 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 pussy. And Sarge is like, why don't I say that word? Because you're not very good at it. But he starts to repeat it for the woman in this weird like sensual voice <laughs> and uh the baby is born safely hooray belgium 1944 <laughs> i i like that they're like force gumping them their way around like world war ii but it's weird because <laughs> he actually was involved in all of these theaters like fuller was yeah um but um, yeah it is just like wow you you hit everything yeah i, mean, I think that's the point of the fact that they're the big red one they're the yeah. first guys they send them in everywhere they need them yeah. to go ahead of the troops they approach a monastery which is really an asylum for uh, what Lee Marvin calls retards and insane people. There's a woman there named Walloon who is a fighter, and she has a plan to kill all the crowds silently to avoid any casualties. But uh, the men are like, just bomb the place. We don't have time for this. Just bomb the place. And Lee Marvin says, killing insane people is not good for public relations. And Griff says, killing sane people's okay. And he's like, exactly. You get it. That's right. In the asylum... A woman in a pink dress, presumably Walloon, is dancing around with a baby doll. Another inmate is army crawling through the courtyard. A German guard is just drinking and lazily groping at Walloon as she dances by. 
See, uh, now we're definitely in the ninth configuration. Yes, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Complete with the Nazi yeah. uniforms. I don't think any of these guys are faking it, though, to get out of war. At least one might be. <laughs> yeah. Outside, another German guard is sleeping against a tree until he is stabbed by Sarge. Somehow Walloon sees this from inside the building, but no one else notices. Or they at least co- cut to a reaction shot like she has a direct line of sight on him doing that. But I don't think there's any way she saw what was happening from inside this building. She pulls a knife out of this baby doll and does her crazy dance around the asylum as she sneaks up on guards and slits all their throats while recklessly singing, the Americans are coming, the Americans are coming, out loud. The Americans are coming! With everyone else on the ground floor dead, she escorts Sarge and a couple other guys to two men that are up in the tower, but there's still many more in the cafeteria. So they kill the tower men, and then in the cafeteria, one side of the room is German soldiers, and the other side is all patients eating. Walloon dances across the officer's table to distract them, but unfortunately a second group of Germans show up just behind the Americans as they're coming into the room, and a firefight breaks out. Lots of shots are getting fired, Griff covers Walloon under a table. Patients are just trying to eat their food while things are exploding around them. And then uh, the army crawler guy finds a gun and shouts, I am one of you! I am sane! I am sane! (laughs) As he's firing blindly around the room, killing patients and Germans and Americans, and he's just shooting everybody because he's not especially sane. But I think the argument is that none of these people are really that sane because they're all shooting at each other. We cut suddenly to downtime in the woods, Zab gets a letter from home that his mother has sold the Dark Deadline book to Hollywood for $15,000, and they're making a movie with Humphrey Bogart and Edward G. Robinson. They ask what he's going to do with the money, and he switches to an accent for one word of the entire film, and he says, Well, first, I think I'm going to blow a thousand bucks on a squad party. He asks what the craziest thing they want to do with a girl is, and Kaiser takes the lead here, and he says, I want to make a girl put her bare ass on a frozen window. And then he's like, why what are you going to do with a frozen ass and he said thaw it out it may take a little time and they're all just laughing hysterically at this i I don't get the joke there's not a joke to it that's just what he wants to do okay he wants to fuck a girl in the ass a cold ass (laughs) 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 okay (laughs) it honestly feels like a line that they should have given to johnson since he has almost nothing to do in this movie besides deliver a baby Uh, And he did that. Suddenly, they're under fire, and they move quickly out of the woods. They get separated, and Sarge calls to them one at a time, and everyone answers, Ho! Except for Kaiser, who says, I'm hit. It almost doesn't sound like him, and we thought at first that this might be a trap. Oh, I definitely uh, thought it didn't sound like him at all. But Sarge finds him dying next to a dead German, like, upside down in a tree. I don't know if he, like, hit him with a grenade or something, and he threw him up into the tree. But uh, he says, did I kill the guy that killed me? And then Sarge says, yes. And he dies. Not Sarge. The other guy. Kaiser dies. We get another quick scene with tanks bearing down on the men in snow, which must be longer in the extended cut because there's nothing to it here. Yeah. And suddenly... It's supposed to be the Battle of the Bulge, I guess. Right. Because... That's uh, not like a famous battle or anything. Yeah. It's like... Skip through this one. Because they talked about like the Germans pushed back and it would have been in winter. We're suddenly at Zab's squad party, spending his movie money, which is cut short when orders come down that they are headed to a place called Falkenau. These are all real missions that the director took part in, even the Falkenau part. Fuller even recorded 16 millimeter footage of the actual liberation of Falkenau, a Czechoslovakian concentration camp that was selected in 2014 for the National Film Registry. The Americans storm the camp, and after taking out all the guards, the four horsemen kick open the doors to the camp and find inmates hiding in the dark. Griff follows one last guard further into the camp to a row of ovens, And he opens the first one and finds just bones of burned prisoners. And he can barely bring himself to open a second oven where he finds the German hiding. And the German fires on him repeatedly, but either the gun is jammed or he's out of bullets. But uh, in a trance, Griff raises his rifle and fires a shot at the soldier and just keeps firing over and over and over. He shoots 18 times before Sarge finds him and gives him another clip to keep shooting. Yeah. Um, Even though he says, I think you got him. And then he fires another, like, four shots into the guy. I mean, I think Sarge understands here that this is sort of... Therapeutic for him. His therapy and sort of getting him over that that hump of being, uh, I don't know, afraid to act. It's like, hey, you've now seen 
the horror of what we're fighting against. Yeah. And you, it's hard to argue to against what you just to did. to do you, this now. Yeah. But it's also like, there is no better argument for shooting a person than finding him hiding in the bones of innocent people shooting at right. you. That he has previously just been shoveling into ovens. Yeah. Sarge finds a young boy in the camp that appears to be starving. He Here, he's unable to convince the boy to eat. So he takes the kid on a picnic, I guess. And the kid actually eats an apple while they're sitting there by a tree. But it's a bit like the scene in Groundhog Day where Phil Connors is just dumping soup down the homeless guy's throat because it seems like they just got there too late. He tries to carry the kid on his back back to the camp and he just passes away on his shoulders, um, probably from prolonged malnutrition and starvation. And uh, the voiceover says he walked around for a half an hour before he could bring himself to put the kid down. He gives him a proper burial in the woods, which I'm not sure if that's a proper burial. I mean, if you're underground, but wouldn't a proper burial be like a headstone and a cemetery? And Yeah, but... More, well, more proper than an oven. Yeah, that's true. The German from earlier, reciting in German as the hunt who started the film that the war is over, Schroeder comes out of the woods, and still not susceptible to the line, Sarge knifes the guy. And the boys show up to tell him that the war's been over for exactly four hours, same as in the beginning. Um, and we get the same exchange with Griff. You didn't know it was over. He did. Griff notices that the German is still alive, and they rush in to save him. Maybe that hun from the beginning was still alive, too. We'll never know. Nobody yeah. checked up on him. And then <laughs> Lee Marvin says, You're gonna live, you son of a bitch. You're gonna live if I have to blow your brains out. <laughs> And you we, gotta, you gotta, you gotta stand trial at your war criminal tra- yeah. <laughs> hearing. We end the film with Zab voiceover saying that he is dedicating this book to those who shot but didn't get shot because survival is the only glory in war, which really just means I dedicate this book to myself. Yeah, because uh, I never got shot. I killed I wa- some people. It, it's it's so uh, off topic, but I wanted to bring up a quote from the monarch from Venture Brothers. Yeah, when he, when asked why he's always using henchmen's twenty one and and twenty four, he says, "I know it's crazy." But they had this rare blend of survivability and expendability that makes them perfect henchmen. <laughs> um, and that's how I feel about these these yeah, four guys. These four guys are just like, <laughs> well, throw them at any problem. And for some reason, they'll walk out with no scratches. Yeah. Um, Writer-director Samuel Fuller. He has writing credits dating back to 1934. Obviously, Merrill's Marauders. He also wrote Targets for Peter Bogdanovich. That's the – have you seen Targets? I have not. I, I know got, of it. Uh, yeah, it's good. It's got um, – what's his name? Uh, Frankenstein in it and uh, uh peter boyle or <laughs> no <laughs> further back boris karloff there you go boris karloff uh, <laughs> as a non-frankenstein character but it's good this was the first thing he directed since a 1969 movie called shark starring burt reynolds but he after this would go on to direct white dog and a documentary called falcon now the impossible about the concentration camp that he helped liberate uh, cinematographer adam greenberg here he's been a dp since the early 60s Here's a sampling of his fascinating filmography. Terminator, Once Bitten, Iron Eagle, Near Dark, Three Men and a Baby, Alien Nation, Turner and Hooch, Ghost, Three Men and a Little Lady, T2, Sister Act, Toys, Sphere, Rush Hour, Snakes on a Plane. (laughs) So he's worked on a lot of different movies. I'm going to say I like him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lee Marvin was the sergeant, just credited as the sergeant. Uh, Probably best known for Dirty Dozen or Paint Your Wagon. He's also in... Paint Your Wagon. Yeah, Paint Your Wagon. <laughs> We're gonna paint your wagon, gonna paint it by... He was also in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance from the same author as uh, A Man Called Horse, which we reviewed earlier this year. And Emperor of the North. I got, got it on here. Gotta bring up Emperor of the I North. I know you love Emperor well, of the North. That was, uh, just be clear, that was a Patreon episode. So. Yep. Okay, I just want to make sure people are like, I didn't hear that episode. Yes. If you missed that, it's your own fault. <laughs> uh, he was also in Cat Baloo from the director of A Man Called Horse. Uh, but yes, Emperor of the North, you said it's it's what, him and Ernest Borgnine, and it's about like the Hobos. Depression era train yeah. poppers. Uh, <laughs> Lee Marvin is, is uh, the A best number hobo. one. The best hobo. He's A number one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and is and, there really a full ranking system for hobos <laughs> yes it's true um, how did they keep track before the internet and and Ernest Borgnon <laughs> is the most notorious bull who like you never ride his train because he's so brutal to anyone yeah. he finds and so this is like his last big hurrah is that he's gonna ride this guy's train that's awesome I still need to see it uh Mark Hamill was Private Griff for Squad 
Uh, he provides a voice in Call of Duty 2, Big Red 1. Uh, like the film, the game follows the exploits of a squad from the Big Red One from North Africa to Eastern Europe. And he's also the voice of the Joker on the animated Batman series. And, of course, he plays Han Solo in Star Trek. Lots of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, he plays Gandalf in Star Trek. Yeah. Patrick really likes angry reviews. <laughs> uh, Robert Carradine was Private Zab for Squad. Uh, he's Lewis. Uh, I think Lewis Skulnick. Is that the last name in Revenge of the Nerds? It just said Lewis on IMDb, but I'm pretty sure it's Lewis Skulnick. He's also Lizzie McGuire's dad. We mentioned this before because he's the youngest Carradine in The Long Riders from earlier this year. He's the brother of David and Keith Carradine uh, and son of uh, John Carradine, right? Yeah, John Carradine. Uh, who was in the film a deleted scene or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bobby DeChico was Private Vinci First Class, First Squad, sorry, whatever that means. Jim Parker in Philadelphia Experiment. Uh, he was also Wally Stevens in 1941. Yeah. Uh, which is like what I recognize him from immediately. Yeah, he he's he's his billing is way down on that movie, but because there's so many other famous people in it. Yeah. but he's essentially the main character, and of that he has movie. a first and last name, yeah. so he's got to be important. He's also in Ghoulies Four, which is direct to video. I didn't know there was a four. I didn't know there was a four. I stopped and started with three because that's <laughs> the best one. Um, is that the one with Murdoch? No, that's the college one. Okay, Murdoch is in one of the first two. I want to yeah. say the second one. Whichever one that had Murdoch on it, it is the best. Yeah. <laughs> Comes out of the grave as a skeleton screaming. That's awesome. And then gets his flesh applied to him. Slowly fleshes up. <laughs> Bobby DeChico was also most recently in a movie called An Interview with God, which is a faith-based film we've mentioned before on this show because it was directed by an actor we've seen this year who also appears in this movie. Probably not a coincidence. Uh, Kelly Ward was Private Johnson First Class, First Squad. Do I need to put the dings and the buzzes again? Nah. Uh, he plays Putsy in Greece, and uh, he's moved largely into voice acting since then, starting with some appearances on GoBots and then a lot on the production side. He does uh, casting, uh, dialogue direction, and a few voices here and there, but he's worked mostly uh, for Disney, uh, almost exclusively Disney stuff for a while now. Stéphane Audran played Walloon. She was Babette in Babette's Feast. She was Alice Seneschal in Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. And she just appeared in that Netflix Orson Welles movie, Other Side of the Wind, that like got re-put together and released on Netflix. No. Um, Siegfried Rausch played Sergeant Schroeder, and he's also Captain Steiger in Patton. Ken Campbell was Private Lemchek, uh, number two on the Bangalore Torpedo. Uh, he did some GoBots voices also, uh, like Kelly Ward above. And he looks a lot like Mark Metcalf to me, and it threw me off for a while because I was like, "What did we just see this guy in?" And I looked it up, and it's like this and GoBots, and I was like, "I don't, I don't watch GoBots, so <laughs> I don't know." Perry Lang was Private Kaiser First Squad. We had him as Paul in the hearse, and we had him as Kelly in Alligator. Also in 1941 with Vinci actor Bobby DeChico, and he directed an Interview with God. Did he really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is an interesting film. I think because it's short, the pacing is actually pretty good. Um, yeah. But I, I honestly feel like there's there's weird, like, just cut at the end of a scene where it's like, wait, there was more to cover there. But I also feel like n all four of these guys don't really get their own moment to shine. I mean, the closest thing Johnson gets is delivering a baby. I don't think Vincey does anything. I mean, he steals a bunch of money from a box that he found. But other than that, he's just here to translate Italian. The only two characters that really got a lot to do were Zab and Griff. And and all Zab really did was narrate. Yeah. Uh, Griff, which, which I could have done without. Like, yeah. really, he just wrote a book. And so, as you were saying, Griff is the only one who really kind of goes through any kind of change or has is a different person from when he started. Right. I was wondering if they were going to try to explain away his the scars again in this one. Oh, yeah. Because he still has some of that the scarring from the, the car accident. I kind of wish it had ended differently. I was kind of feeling like as we were approaching the end, I figured there was going to be a callback to how we began the film. But I kind of figured it was sort of going to be that passing of the torch where it happened to somebody else and Lee Marvin was going to be like, look, it happens. It's okay. Like you didn't know. And it's like, and he knew. And, well, they'd be like, and he knew. So, so it was sort of like the same response that he got. He was then passing on to this next generation as the words of wisdom. What if, what if we're instead we're like, we're paying it backward 
and he's sitting with the guys and they all find out that the war is over and he goes off on his yeah. own to take a piss and the german guy comes to stab him and he's like the war's over the war's over and the german guy stabs him and he dies in the woods yeah i'm like i, I feel like either way it, it could have had more impact than just sort of repeating the same scene again yeah. but but trying to save the soldier after the act rather yeah. than letting him die yeah but um i think it's enjoyable i think i would give this a thumbs up I give it a thumbs up, which I thought was, you know, I was really dreading going into this because I hate watching more war movies and yeah. I really would never do it unless I had to. And I had to. And I liked it. I, I can't think of it. another one that's less than two hours even though. Really. A war movie? Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd have to give it some thought. I think even Three Kings is more than two hours. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I could like grasp at straws and kind of like pull up like maybe Heroes of Telemark or... Uh, but that's that's a fake war movie, right? I, I, does it have to be real war, or, or does it? <laughs> what does no. That what, mean? what about that one uh, starring Eli Roth in the Tower that within Inglorious Bastards? Is, oh yeah. Well, no. Do they ever say the runtime of that movie? Because <laughs> uh, no, because here's a telemark. It's a World War II movie, but it's it's a fictional account. Right. It's like the guns of Navarone. Yes. It's not that didn't really happen. That didn't it's, happen. It's just a movie about World War II that took place during World War II. Interesting. And Three Kings is just a hair under two hours, for the record. Is it? It's uh, 114 minutes. Oh, okay. Interesting. Like A Bridge Too Far is super long. That was the double cassette. Well, I also give this movie a thumbs up. I wouldn't say that I'm in love with it, um, but it was enjoyable. It had a lot of like interesting things that they brought up that I... Because I, I, well, I mentioned Forrest Gump. Uh, it, it was yeah. kind of being serious because like, they're moving through so many different things so quickly. It's like, oh, the Battle of the Bulge. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's a buzz bomb. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. okay. Like, they're, they're just bringing up stuff. Because, like, the, especially the buzz bombs, like, that was more towards the end uh, of World War II. Because, like, this was, like, Germany was lashing out. Yeah. You know, the, the V-1 and the V-2 uh, rockets were their last-ditch efforts. And so th- there's a lot of cool things that are happening in it. I mean, we've already discussed it. Just the flaws. It's like, I don't know who this movie is about. Yeah. And uh, it seems like a lot of characters get like shorthanded yeah really get much to do i I think it almost could have been more interesting to take this movie and have it be about the four soldiers who they met and didn't learn didn't want to learn their names have it be about them but then always have these four guys surviving in the background like they're the ones who keep surviving but the main characters keep dying yeah (laughs) (laughs) well they do kind of the same thing in saving private ryan too, and and the hurt locker too yeah yeah where does this go on your list, Jess? Uh, it's pretty high, actually. Uh, I never thought I'd I'd say that for a horror movie, but um, right now it's going. Oh gosh, it's so it's so hard to compare some of these things. Like right now, I'm debating how I feel about this versus Blue Lagoon. <laughs> I I am in that exact spot. Jesse. I'm like, uh, uh, I don't know. I think I'm gonna put it above blue lagoon and below the long riders and as much as i love blue lagoon i think this was probably a better movie yeah just just better filmmaking um but yeah below below the long riders and above blue lagoon which puts it in 13th place for the year so far that's not bad uh richard what are we thinking um i am also putting it above blue lagoon but my blue lagoon is much lower (laughs) (laughs) um so this this is going to be between uh, it's going to be below Stuntman, but above Blue Lagoon. Puts it in 24th place. Okay. Um, I'm putting it a little bit lower. It's actually in 32nd place for me. But it's also below The Long Riders um, and above Urban Cowboy hmm. for me. How does it compare to Blue Lagoon? <laughs> uh, let's see. Where is Blue Lagoon on my list right now? Uh, Blue Lagoon is 21 oh, okay. on my list. Hmm. I think that's about it for this one. Uh, if you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. And on that note, I'd like to give a special shout out to Derelict88 for your iTunes review. Thank you so much. If you're feeling especially generous, you can support the show through patreon.com slash vintage video podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Cheech and Chong's next movie, which IMDb describes like so. The two stoners and their friends go through another series of crazy drug-influenced misadventures.
We leave you now with the trailer for Cheech and Chong's next movie. Me, 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 me. Yeah, yeah, right there. Okay, let's try. Mexican Americans don't like to just get into gang fights. They like flowers and music and white girls named Debbie too. In the tradition of the great comedy teams, war and pestilence. Are you ready for the end of time? Death and taxes. Responsibility is a heavy responsibility, man. Bad breath <laughs> and body odor. What, you the fast smeller? <laughs> And punk rock <laughs> comes Cheech and Chong. Go on, they walk, they talk, <laughs> and now they make number two. I got nowhere to go. Well, go see a movie or something. Cheech and Chong's next movie. All right, this is the tape. Mark it. <laughs> it's the film that spits when it sings. Hey, man. <laughs> The film that never changes its underwear. The film that leaves a stain on the theater screen. The dirty and filthy and deceased! We ain't dressed right. That's why we ain't getting no respect. When you go into these neighborhoods, man, you gotta have your stuff all together, man. You gotta have your attitude and your whole trip down, man. You know, everybody throws their bad looks at you, you know? Is it a love story? Take you all over for a dime. Okay, for free, then. Is it a thriller? Too much. Shake them, you won't break them. Mm. Is it a musical? Treat me like a fool. Treat me mean and cruel. Is it a foreign film? I think they're Iranian. Is it an alien attack? No. Oh. Wow, oh, look at that. For the answers to these and other fundamental questions. He is that way. See Cheech and Chong's next movie. Come on, let's go, man. This looks like good fun. <laughs> because at a time like this, what everybody really needs is a good hit. Yeah, I don't think you better light it in here, man. What? That's gas fumes, man. Oh, man. Cheech and Chong's next movie. <laughs>